when you can see it. Great, I can see your screen and you. So I've started the recording. Thanks so much. Thank you. So hi, everybody. Thank you for joining this session of Alma Insights on remote storage models and workflows in Alma. The point of this session is really to survey what we have and uh, make sure that everyone knows what is available, everyone uses the workflows that best suits them. And if you have any questions during the session, please write them in the chat. I will try to answer them. So we'll start by talking a little bit about what remote storage is, what we mean uh, when we talk about remote storage and the common types and workflows that Alma libraries work with and then talk about the models that are supported in Alma and dive into some more details about configuring and, and working with these different models. And the session will have two parts. One is the single institution storage models and the other is the consortial storage models, which is uh, relatively new and uh, it's for consortia that have a network zone. So, Remote storage is a facility where libraries store items, can be books, these days can be other things as well. And it's not on site. It's, there are several reasons to do this. You can have limited shelving space inside the library and want to have a bigger storage facility off campus, for example, or in a different part of the campus. You can have special collections that need temperature control or other special conditions. You can have uh, maybe a robotic system that needs its own warehouse. So there are all sorts of reasons and all sorts of storage facilities that behave slightly differently and would need a different setup and a different workflow in Alma. The physical inventory is managed in that remote storage. It might be using a third party system to do so. It might not be and um, inventory is managed in Alma by the operators of the remote storage facility. But regardless of how you manage your remote storage, if the items in it are um, in circulation, if they're requestable, if they're loanable, if there's a reading room that people can come in and see them, then okay, this is in the way. Um, then uh, you would need to have those requests placed in Discovery or, or in Alma, go to the remote storage so that items are retrieved and made available to your patrons. So that's a very important part of the remote storage models and workflows, that communication of requests. So how do remote storage items circulate? You have a physical location in Alma for the remote storage. It's similar to other locations and it belongs to a fulfillment unit. So it has fulfillment unit rules, it has terms of use, and the items in the remote storage location would circulate according to those terms of use. And the handling, the actual handling of the loans and returns would usually happen in Alma. So you could have an Alma circulation desk at the site performing the loans and returns and delivering directly to the patrons, or you could have transit from the remote storage to the library to fulfill the request at the regular circulation desks of the library. Um, you may even have a remote storage that is able to fulfill requests independently without having a, an Alma station at the remote storage and then deliver uh, communicate to Alma using NSIP messages, check in and check out, that items are checked in and checked out of the remote storage so that the inventory in Alma is correctly available or not available on the shelf. And also that um, the activity is recorded in Alma for your analytics reports and all of that. So the common remote storage types that we know of is one, a remote storage facility with no management system. It's a big room. There are a lot of books in it, but there's no system to manage it. So you're using Alma to manage the remote storage inventory. And usually you would have 
a desk, a location, manage everything using um, slips, request slips, or slip reports, and uh, pick from shelf list in AMA. And all the request loans, returns, everything would be handled at an AMA desk. Another option is your remote facility does have a third party management system and you can export a scheduled, have a scheduled export of a file, an XML file from Alma with the requested items that goes to an SFTP location and is used by that third party management system to get the items off the shelf. You can have a robot, which is very cool. Uh, an automated storage and retrieval systems. And usually that provides very fast and efficient delivery to patrons, sometimes overnight delivery using self-check. So, so it is often preferred to other locations while usually remote storage facilities are the last priority. So if I have items on site, I would like to use them to fulfill requests and only if they're not available go to the remote storage because it takes a little longer. But if you have something like this, you might want to prefer it because it can operate all hours of the day and it's uh, very fast. So we have those options. We will discuss them later. And then for uh, our newer model, the consortial storage, it's an institution that stores items for other institutions in the same network that share a network zone. It can be a dedicated AMA institution or part of one of the existing institutions that uh, serves to host a um, joint use location, if you will. And then delivery will be based on AMA's fulfillment network or resource sharing workflows that the network uses. Um, and, and if you want to know more about those workflows, we'll discuss them a little bit at the end, but there are also sessions, some of them by me, about uh, consortial resource sharing workflows in Alma that you're welcome to check out. So let's talk a little bit about how to configure and use single institution remote storage models. So I'm a single institution. I have one or more remote storage facilities. How do I configure this in Alma? How do I work with this? So like I said, we have several remote storage models that we support the very basic AMA location and desk, so there's no third-party integration. The XML integration, where requests are exported in an XML files in a scheduled manner, using a scheduled job, and then that XML uh, has several variations that you can use. And we have the XML NSIP, where you have the requests going out on the same uh, scheduled XML file, but you also have NSIP check-in and check-out and also um, inventory updates that can be sent to the remote storage system. And the ASRS where requests are sent at real time as they are created, not collected and sent um, on a scheduled job. So how will requests to the remote storage behave is configured in a few places, but most important, importantly, in the remote storage facility configuration. So if I look in AMA, in the configuration menu, and this is an institution level configuration, not a library level configuration, um, under fulfillment, locations, remote storage, I can, configure my remote storage facilities. You can see that this institution has two, the offsite remote storage facility and the remoter storage from this morning session. And here I can configure all sorts of things. So the first thing I would say is, do I prefer the remote storage over other locations on site or not? Usually, like I said before, remote storage locations take longer to fulfill requests. So I would not check this, but if I have a very, very efficient remote storage where turnaround time is faster than my on-site items, I can check this. And then when AMA fulfills a request, it will prefer locations that are off-site attached to this remote storage facility and not 
uh, my local on-site locations. I also have priority compared to other remote storages if I have more than one facility. This is the further storage facility that takes longer, as we can see, so it gets the lowest priority. Alma will try other storage facilities before going to this one. I don't have to have an integration profile, but if I want to export XMLs, receive NTIP uh, check-in, or integrate with an ASRS system, then I would have an integration profile that I can select here. We will see how to define those a little later. The transit scheme decides whether any the, the pickup location can directly reshelve back to the storage or it has to go through the location's owning desk in order to reshelve. And I have a little bit here about what type of requests and what type of information goes out to the facility. One is handles digitization requests locally. What this means is for physical item requests, I place a request with a remote storage facility, they send me the item, I give the patron the item, done. But if the item just wants a scan of a few pages or an article, I don't actually need to move physical items around. They can send me the item, I can scan it, and then send the file to my patron, but maybe the remote storage facility can do that themselves. Maybe they have scanners and they can scan a few pages and save moving the items around and send that directly to the patron. If I check this, the patron's email will go out as part of the XML to the remote storage system so that they can reach out and send the file directly to the patron. I have the define in transit to remote storage when the item is returned so that it's not in place until it is checked in at the remote storage. And I have allow manual description requests, which is a lot of times in the AMA integration with remote storage, the requests are based on specific items. I send the barcode of the item that I want. If I have five items in the remote storage, I'm not asking for any of them. I'm asking for a specific one. But what happens if I have serial um, serials that aren't fully cataloged? I have a holdings record, but no items, or I have some items cataloged, but not necessarily all. Alma has the ability to have a general hold request or um, request another issue. I have issues 1 to 14 cataloged, but I need volume uh, issue 16. I can request another issue, write down what I need, and the librarians will look for it for me. If I have a barcode-based integration and the remote storage can only provide items that I requested specifically, such a such a request wouldn't work. There's no librarian there, there's a system. They can't see the patron saying, I want the one with a red cover from 1995 and go look for it. And therefore, I may not want to allow manual description requests to be sent to the remote storage. Someone will need to look at that and request a specific item or help the patron request a specific item. Uh, and I have here a calendar where I can define the opening times for the remote storage. This is informational. So as you can see, the remote storage facility configuration determines what and how I send to the remote storage and how it behaves. All right, the next thing I want to do is create a physical location or attach a physical location to this facility. So this happens at the library level. I go to my library, I go to my physical locations, and we can see here the offsite location, building nine, is attached to the offsite remote storage facility. Not the one we looked at, another one. And I do want to take a minute to talk about how this is configured. So this location, is attached to the general fulfillment unit and behaves according to those rules. And it's also attached to two desks. One is the offsite desk, and that reshelves and transits items. It picks from shelves, and it only has a reshelf relationship with the item. Usually this would be off. 
So this is the desk where requests would go. So they would pick it from the shelf, scan it in, and put it in transit to the regular default circulation desk in the library where the actual fulfillment actions, loaning, returning would take place. And then the item would go back into transit and get reshelved by its owning desk. And then once I have that, I have a remote storage facility. This is the most basic integration of location, desk, remote storage facility, and um, no need for any integration profiles for this. I use the pick from shelf list, the, the request slips, the slip report. I can even use uh, the AMA mobile app for circulation desks that has the pick from shelf list and can use the camera to um, scan barcodes so I can pick from shelf and scan as I go. All of those are available at any desk. And if you man if you have a desk in the remote storage facility, you can do that. So just to recap the four remote storage models for single institution, we have the remote storage facility, physical location, and circulation desk for the Alma location. The request export is done manually by the operator using the pick from shelf list and the delivery is done in Alma. We're now going to talk about the integration options. So we have the simple integration profile that has on top of the remote storage and physical location also the integration profile. It exports requests with a scheduled XML. You can also run it manually when you need. And the delivery is again done in Alma. We have the XML NSIP integration profile, which again has the remote storage facility location and an integration profile. It has the same export of requests, but it can deliver in Alma or in the remote storage facility. And we have the ASRS. We support the Dometic protocol, and this is a real-time export of requests using TCP IP-based messages. And again, the delivery can be done in AMA or the remote storage. So we looked at the location and desk model. And I'll just uh, um, mention in the workflow, like I said, I see the request in the pick from shelf. I get the resource. I scan it at the remote desk. It goes into transit. Or if the remote storage serves patrons directly and they can come pick it up, it doesn't have to have this transit step. The loan and return are done in Alma, as with any other resource, and then the book gets transited back and reshelved. The XML integration profile means that I need to have an integration profile, again, at the institution level. If you recall, there was a drop down where I could select an integration profile for the remote storage facility, and it's here in the integration profiles. We have integration profiles of type remote storage. And then if I have my XML profile, it goes into a configured SFTP connection. There are a few XML options here. There's XML, which is the default format, and there's BIPSYS and WBMayor, which have slightly different formats to work with their systems. So you would usually need, unless you work with the same system, you would usually work with a regular XML format. And then in the actions, I have whether or not this integration is active, whether or not I want to include requests or information in physical item requests. So for digital item requests, for digitization requests, it depends on whether or not the storage handles digitization locally. If they do, they need to know who the patron is and what their email is. If they don't, they don't. Sort of the thing, same thing goes here. If my storage um, sends personal delivery to the patron's home or office address directly, I would want to include the information of the requester. If not, I may not want to include it to protect my patron's privacy from the operators of that remote storage, which may not be part of the library exactly. I can also decide when 
I choose the specific item that I'm requesting. Like I said before, when we request an item from the remote storage, it's a specific item. I send the barcode. And I can choose that specific item and make it not available when the request is actually sent to the remote storage. This is the default option. But some libraries choose to do it beforehand when the request is placed because while the item is still on the shelf, it's already requested and not really available for other people. Once we get to export the list of requests, it will become unavailable. I can choose which type of requests I'm willing, I'm sending. So do I send hold request, digitization request, um, library digitization from reading lists, move and work order requests. I can schedule it to um, every 12 hours or every day at different times. And I can also run an export in real time. So I want to run an export now. I don't want to wait to the scheduled option. I can choose which types of requests to export and run that export. So that is the XML. Um, and then I have my XML and SIP integration profile, which is more or less the same. So it's exactly the same for the export. But if I select here XML and SIP, you can see that this stays exactly the same. But I now have another section of a URL for outgoing messages and an inventory updates job because this information goes out to update um, an inventory changes and we can also receive check-in and check-out and SIP messages to complete the other direction. So when working with XML and SIP, I have um, a two-direction communication or I can have two-directional communication with a remote storage system. My last option would be the Dometic ASRS, and this is completely different. We'll see. So we don't have all of those options. We don't have the do I or do I not send request or information? When do I itemize? Because this is done using the Dometic protocol, and we follow that, or it will break the connection. And the requests are exported as they're created. They're not collected and exported um, every day. So there's no need to say, do I want to itemize immediately or do I want to wait for the export? The export is immediate. So I have here the configuration of my remote host name and port. I have a certificate that I can download because the connection between the uh, robot and Alma has to be secure. And again, the inventory updates job so that we can update the system when something is added or deleted in AMA. So before I move on to the consortial remote storage configuration, I would like to stop and, and check if there are any questions. So far, there's no questions, Lily, but everybody, if you would like to submit a question, please feel free to do so over in the chat box. And just make sure you select all panelists whenever you submit it. Okay. Um, I think you're safe to go ahead and keep going forward. All right. So I'll move on to the consortial remote storage, but you can send questions about any part of the session and I'll uh, try to look into them at the end. Hopefully, we'll have enough time. So for the consortial storage configuration, we're talking about not about an external remote storage integration with a specific institution in the network. Those work the same as what we've discussed so far. Being a part of a network doesn't mean you can't have those. They're just a, um, an integration with a single institution in the network. What we're going to talk about now is a shared remote storage for the network members. So several members of the network work with the same facility and that can be managed as part of the network in an institution zone. Setting this up is not as easy and independent as a single uh, institution integration that I've shown before. It requires 
some help from Exclubris. If you're provisioning another institution zone, it has costs, it's a project. Um, if you're having one of your institution zones hosting for other institutions, it is recommended to reach out for help. Also, some of the things that I will show today are not yet released generally. They're still being tested by our development partners. So I won't show it in the demo environment because it doesn't have it yet. But I will also show a screenshot. So we have an institution and it has the items and the items move to the other institutions using resource sharing or fulfillment network workflows that we'll discuss. So a few conditions for this. First of all, there needs to be a network zone and the bib record has to be in the network zone. So I have to be able to find the bib record in the network zone. I may have my own local items for it. And then the institution that serves as a storage facility has other items for it. But the bib record has to be in the network zone. So all our items are under one bibliographic record. And then the discovery displays that record and the remote storage institutions inventory. This is configurable. Again, I would suggest getting some help doing that, but just like you can show inventory and, and bibliographic records available in other institutions in your network, you can show this because it's another institution in your network. The items can be purchased by me and then transferred to the remote storage facility, to the remote storage institution zone, or it can be purchased um, doing a shared purchasing in that remote storage institution zone using shared funds. We have uh, support for that. I purchase, but move the item onward being um, tested now. That's what I was discussing before. So I'll show you a little bit of how that looks. And then the analytics of the items and usage would be um, in the network analytics so this is what I was talking about before. You can have locations in your own institution zone that are actually hosted location, host location configuration, if this is turned on in your environment, will be available. And then items purchased and placed in these locations, when they are received, get removed from your institution and created automatically in the host location in, in the other institution zone. And you can configure a few things here. First of all, who the host institution and location is, but also do I want to automatically create that item upon receiving or do I want to manually transfer it when I'm ready? Um, do I want to withdraw my own item when I do this or do I want to keep um, a suppressed record? Do I, oh, sorry about that. Just trying to move the mouse. Um, do I want to place the item in the hosts in process items in a work order because I catalog some and then send it to them and then they barcode and process it physically before it becomes available on the shelf? Or do I do all the work and send them a shelf ready copy so once they scan it in in their institution, it's directly on the shelf? So all sorts of things that I can configure here to best reflect my relationship with that storage facility and their ALMA. So we have three models of fulfillment and requesting for this model for this consortial storage. One is resource sharing using classic ISO ALMA partners and all, all that it entails, checking availability, checking requestability, the other is automated fulfillment network, and the last is the fulfillment network. You might want to have the same model as what you have with the other institutions in your network because you're familiar with it and your patrons are familiar with it. And you might want to have something a little different for the storage facility because the relationship with it are a bit different. So I'm not going to go into too many details about how each of these workflows work, but I do want to cover some things that may be of interest when deciding which one you will use. So first of all, the item owner would always be the remote storage. Um, that institution has the item. That institution is 
responsible for managing the holdings and the items that patrons will see in the discovery. Okay. I may have purchased the item, but I moved it to another institution and it is now in that institution's control and they are responsible for it. Whether or not the request is automatically directed to the remote storage, so for resource sharing and automated fulfillment network, yes, according to the RODA, so it might be the last or the first in the RODA, so I first go to the storage facility and then to the other institutions in my network, or for, first to the other institutions in my network and only if they can't fulfill the request to the remote storage facility, that's up to my configuration. For the fulfillment network, this is not automatic. The patron requests directly from the remote storage. They have a relationship directly with the remote storage facility. They see what that storage facility has and place the request from get it in other institution. The loan owner for resource sharing is the patron's institution. They do not have any direct communication with the remote storage. For AFN and FN, the remote storage owns the loan. They are responsible for the terms of use. They're re responsible for fines and fees. Uh, they will send the patron, the um, uh, item is waiting on the whole shelf notification, all of that, just like with other institutions in my network. Um, the pickup location for resource sharing is always the patron's institution because the patron is requesting from the institution. That institution then reaches out to the remote storage, remote storage transit back to the owning institution, and they then loan me the item. For AFN, for fulfillment network and automated fulfillment network, you can configure requests anywhere if you want. So let's say now if I study in one city, but we're studying in Zoom, so I live in my hometown for a while, and there's a, a member of the network there, I might want to have items delivered there and not to my university. So that could work nicely. So you can have pickup anywhere configured. And the last but important question is, do we want to share patron information with the remote storage facility? Because they will have access to Alma and in the fulfillment network models, a linked account for the user will get created in that remote storage Alma institution and they will have access to patron information while in the resource sharing they have no direct communication with the patron they don't know who the patron is only the patron's home institution knows so it really depends on your relationship with the remote storage and what you want them to see what you want them to do and how much control you want to have over the fulfillment of your own patrons any questions so far before we just look at each model? Lily, we did have one question about, um, I'm, I, I don't know if this is specifically relevant to this, but we had a question. Can an existing circulation desk serve for check-in and check-out of more locations, including remote storage? So we'll do reshelving also for items that don't belong to the remote storage. So the answer is yes. Um, if you don't have, if we go to the remote storage facility integration, one of the things there was the transit scheme. So for reshelving, not for picking from the shelf, if I want to have a dedicated desk for picking from the shelf, but I want to have, um, no transit and, and reshelving directly from the the pickup location where the patrons return the items, then this is the transit scheme. Do I have to return at the owning desk or can I return at the requested pickup and will go into reshelving directly and won't need to go through the whole process? So you can do that. If you have a remote storage that really doesn't have its own um or that, that has a third party system that picks from the shelf and sends to Alma, you can just have that storage facility served for check in and check out by your regular circulation desk and handle everything there. Reshelve, send back, have it processed in that third party integration. So you don't have to have a dedicated desk 
for the remote storage. It is convenient if there's no other system that manages inventory there, and then you have your pick from shelf list that is just for the locations of the remote storage, and you can handle that. But it's not necessary. It really sort of depends on, on your model and how you manage inventory in the remote storage and how you manage fulfillment for your pa uh, patrons. I hope that answers the question. Okay. He said, okay, thanks. Thanks, Lily. Good. Um, so just a little look at the models and what they mean. So the first model of resource sharing, the patron's home institution manages all the communications with a patron. The patron places a resource sharing request. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with that. In their home institution's discovery, this is, or it can be, you don't have to have automatic standing rules and automatic quota assignment, but you can have it automatically sent to the remote storage. The remote storage sends that home institution the item, and then the loan is created and managed in that institution. They control the terms of use, the managing of loans, the fines and fees. You can have um, temporary item creation rules so that items from the remote storage may have slightly different terms of use than regular resource sharing items, and, um, and you're set. So a scenario would be, I search in Primo V of my institutions, I see the holdings of my home institution, and maybe other institutions in the network, maybe the remote storage holdings, depending on how this is configured. If an item is owned by my own library, I place a regular patron hold, digitization request, whatever, done. If an item doesn't belong to my own library, I'll have a how to get it, and I'll be able to place a resource sharing request, digital or physical, and that request would be passed on by the librarians or by the library automatically or in a moderated fashion, go to the remote storage and get the item for me. So that would be the patron experience. In an automated fulfillment network, the remote storage manages all the communications with the patrons except for the initial request. So I place uh, an AFN request, which looks exactly like a resource sharing request in my home institution's discovery. This is sent to the remote storage, but once it's sent to the remote storage, the borrowing request closes and a regular hold request is placed for me on the item in the remote storage. A linked account is created for me in the remote storage institution and they handle it from there on directly with me. So they would control the terms of use, the managing the loan, the fines and fees, sending me any emails necessary like overdue notifications or courtesy notices. That all happens there. The pickup location doesn't have to be them. They may still be able to send an item into transit into my home institution or other institutions in the network, but they own the loan. So my experience as a patron is I search in my institution's Primo V, I see the holdings of my home library and maybe also of other institutions and the remote institution, my own items, I create a hold request regular like I do for all the others. If something is not owned by my institution, I place an AFN request, a resource sharing request really, same form, and then it will go to the remote storage, create a hold request for me there automatically, and from there on, I interact with that institution. You can have, if you have AFN with your other institutions in the network, you can still have a resource sharing partner with the remote storage so that the interaction with them would be different because it's the same form and it can go over RODA with both AFN partners and resource sharing partners. Or the other way around, you can have resource sharing workflows with the other institutions, but AFN workflow with the remote storage. So you can mix and match, uh, but I think most institutions would rather have the same just because it's less confusing for patrons. Sometimes patrons get confused. Some of them are very young. Um, the third model would be fulfillment network that has a different discovery experience because I place the request, I know who I'm requesting with as a patron, and I place the request directly from the remote storage facility. 
they manage the loan, they, they get the request, they manage the loan. My home library never knows any of this happened. They're not involved in the process. So my experience here would be I log into my institution's Primo VE. I see the holdings of the home library, but I also see get it in other institutions and what holdings other libraries have, including the remote storage institution, and which would have a, a proper name for me to understand what it is. And then I would click get it in this remote storage facility and place a hold request from that get it directly with the remote storage facility. And from there on, it's me with them. My home institution was just a way to discover what they have, but they're not part of the flow. So that's it for our consortial models. And if there are any questions, now would be the time. I'll stop sharing. No other questions have come through. Sorry, what? Sorry, no other questions have come through so far. So everybody, this is your big moment. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, please take advantage of the chat. <laughs> So let's give it a minute and see if uh, anyone else has a question. And if not, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you have uh, a good day or good evening, depending on where you are. And um, we will see you in future webinars. Yeah, I'll give it just one more minute. And while we do, I'll just remind everybody a survey should automatically pop up whenever this closes. Please be sure to fill it out. Give us any um, input if you've got something else you wish you'd like us to produce for you, any other information you'd like to learn more about. We really take all of that feedback very seriously and, um, and use it to inform what we're doing. And Lily, I don't see anything else coming in other than some thanks and that this was very helpful. Oh, wait, here's one question that just came in. In an AFN network, is it not the home library of the patron that manages communication and fines for items at non-home libraries? Question, what if SIS loaded data of patrons at home libraries out of date or incorrectly loaded? Okay, so the first question in an AFN network, no, in an AFN network, what happens is when I place a request through the AFN with another institution, a linked account is created for me in that institution. What is shared in that linked account is configurable. So it can be the sort of minimal email and name. It can also have other information depending on your network. And, um, and then that linked account gets the loan and all the, the communication is done there. Now I can, depending on the relationships between the institution and whether or not the specific item I wanted can travel to other institutions, that's configurable. I can request for it to be delivered to me at my home institution, but the loan would still happen in the item owner according to the item owner's terms of use. So if there are fines and fees or things like that, they're accrued at the item owner and would need to be handled there. So the loan owner in an AFN is all, always the item owner. Uh, what happens if SAS loaded data of patrons is out of date or incorrectly loaded? Well, it would need to be fixed. Some information when changed by the library is protected. So if I change the user group of a user, I can decide if I want it to be overridden next time the SIS runs or not, but most information when working with an external user that is controlled by an SIS system will always get overridden by that system. It shouldn't really affect AFN. The, the, it is true that when I perform an action in another institution, my linked account will get refreshed. So if there's corrupted data in my home institution, the linked account will get it, but you just need to rerun the SAS with the updated da data, and the next time my linked account gets refreshed, it will get the right data. So that shouldn't be a, a well, you know, a corrupted SAS uh, getting loaded into the system. I can't say that it's not a huge problem, but it's easily, relatively easily fixed by uh, loading the correct data, and it shouldn't have too many effects on AFN because only when I do 
activities in the other institutions, I get a linked account created or refreshed. So it's not an automatic push of the updated data all the time. It's only if I try to renew or if I ask for another book that I get the refresh. I hope that that answered the question. If not, then uh, just give me some more details on the scenario. Yes. Okay, she said thanks and yes. Um, okay. and <laughs> it depends on the institution. Th that's always true. Yeah. Um, what I could say is uh, it's not really related to the, the um, subject of the webinar, but you could use an API to sort of override the corrupted data. Um, just create a um, take the updated correct information and use the users API to update users that will update external users as well. And you can open for updates and update the user until the next run of the SAS. So if I have the wrong phone number or the wrong uh, something like that. Um, up with a, you said, I can decide if user group is overridden by next SAS load and she asks how. Okay, so when you do open for update on an external user that is controlled by an SAS system, uh, it will ask you for this list of fields, do you want the next override the next run of the SAS to run them to override them or not? And that is, I think, pin, um, user group, title. There's a few of them. I, I can't remember them off the top of my head. It is documented and it also says the list, like the pop-up says, these are the fields that you can prevent from getting overridden. Um, also, you want to say no for, it's either yes or no, but you don't have to change the others. You can just change the user group and language and then the others won't get over it. And if you don't change them manually, it's only for manual changes that you can do this. We had a separate question asking when the loan is owned by the institution zone, how are the loan statistics used and shared? Oh, I don't, I don't see that written. So can you just repeat yeah, here, let me, the question um, for me? Sure. I'll copy it so everybody can see it. It's just easier for me when I read a question. Yeah, than when I know, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for everybody, I just put it in the chat. It's when the loan is owned by the institution zone. How are the loan statistics used and shared? Okay. So like I said, um, in this model, the owner of the item is the remote storage facility that hosts the item. So that facilities analytics will have all the usage statistics and you can have um, your network analytics have some of that as well. So you can either run the reports in the remote storage analytics or in the networks analytics. Um, it is true that you won't have cost usage because the costs would be in the purchasing institution and the usage would be in the hosting institution. So unless you do the purchasing in the remote storage, um, you won't be able to do that, but you will have the usage. I hope that answers the question. All right. Said, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Let's give it a minute. Um, I, I do want to say uh, to um, the person that asked about corrupted SAS files, if you need help with that, I suggest maybe opening a support case because without having all the details, it's hard for me, though I am the business analyst for user management as well as fulfillment and resource sharing, it's hard for me to give c concrete solutions on a hypothetical but support should be able to give advice and help. And if they can, they will reach out to us in development for more information. So it sounds like you encountered some sort of problem and, and you, you don't have to deal with it alone. You can, you can reach out. All right, Lily, I think we've answered everything. So thank you so much for today's presentation. Thank you all of you for attending Alma Insights. We hope we'll see you next month at the next one or at other trainings that we're offering. And we really appreciate it. I wish you all a really lovely day.
Bye. Have a good day.